Yesterday, I saw this barista that it's a robot and makes cappuccinos and it does a pretty fantastic job. People love it and people are like, this is so creepy. So sometimes you need the, the right conditions for something to really take off and, and happen. What I've seen in the past 10 years is since the first article came, out, you know, data scientist is the sexiest job of the of the last century. I've seen an evo evolution in the in the profile of data scientists from being um, seen as the I don't know if it's going to sound bad, but like the nerd in the company that just develops something and doesn't interact with the rest of the organization to really becoming influencers, influencing those decision makers to sign the check. What allows us as data scientists to do that jump in building that trusted relationship is the ability to to have communication skills. Growing up, I, I was in Italy for basically a month yeah. and a half this year and it was culture shock for me. So I can't imagine what going oh, the other direction. Oh but. man. The first thought I had like, these people don't know how to drive. <laughs> I felt the same way in Italy. So it See? Out so great. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's like ad adaptation. That's all it is about. I'm here with Marinella Profi. She's the head of product marketing strategy for AI at SaaS. Marinella, welcome to the Kensington Standards Podcast. Thank you so much podcast. for having me here. I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, it's such a pleasure. You know, we, we got to talking the other day. You were so excited about generative AI. You were so excited about all the things that, um, you know, all the innovation that's coming in AI overall. And I had just had to have you on the show. Um, I'd first like to start and learn a little bit about you. Okay. And to do that, I always start with a question. How did you first get interested in data? Oh, okay. That's um, oh. that's a long story. I'll try to make it short. Make it. We got like an hour. <laughs> we Go have nuts. time. Great. So, uh, I've always been passionate about math since I was a since I was a child. I started um, I started speaking when I was four, and um, reading when I was four. I started reading when I was four, so it was very. Um, and I had always this. I've always had this analytical mindset since I was a since I was a child, and in college. I decided to go for econometrics uh, for my bachelor, so that was my my first um, kind of studying in, the, in, in college. Um, and when I was studying, you know, econometrics is basically the science that combines economics with macro and micro ec uh, economics trends. So it, it helps you understand why certain scenarios and why certain things happen in economics. Um, social. Um, so from how is inflation impact, how is exchange rates impact, interest rates and and uh, other things like wars, like how does this impact the global economy? And there are obviously models involved into this, like machine learning, analytical models involved into uh, studying uh, macro and mm, economic scenarios. Um, and so that's where I started to get the first approach with like the concept of model analytical model. Um, but during the bachelor, I didn't really get the chance to explore how um, how it works and so like how a model works. And so I left out the bachelor, obviously uh, really passionate about what I what I learned in terms of economics, but I really was wondering and I had this curiosity, how do you build a model? Like how does how are these things built? Like how do you teach something to 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 have this knowledge, how do you transfer this knowledge to to a model? And so that's where I did my my master's in statistics. Uh, I probably am going to say something that I don't know how many people are going to agree with this, but for me, the beginning of everything is statistics. Like we call it data science, we call it analytics. Uh, then it became machine learning when we had the big data explosion, right? For the first time, we had so many data, and then it became machine learning. Um, but for me, as a statistician, I see the statistics. And so my, my, during my master's, that it's where I really uh, started approaching the world of data. And I was pretty lucky because when I was doing my master's was also the explosion of big data. And so all those models that like simple, you know, logistic regressions or inferential statistics, uh, it really started to be applied to more uh, deep learning algorithms, more machine learning algorithms. Um, and so the concept of neural network, which was obviously it wasn't a new concept, but it started to become really famous within the academia world, um, and so we started to experiment with it. So that is where I really got very, very passionate about um, data. And after my first master um, in statistics, again, I'm a very curious person. I actually have a tattoo that says curiosity in Italian, so because I am from Italy, and 
uh, after my first master, I still felt like something was missing, which is something that I really consider very important when we talk about data, which is the data storytelling piece. Um, so how do I, I felt like I had that technical piece, but I felt like I wasn't really ready to tell a story and to explain that in simple words. My family had no clue about what I was doing. I was, it wasn't easy for me to explain what I was doing in, in school. Um, some of them still don't know what I'm doing today. And so, um, and so that's why I decided to move on and did the second master in business administration. So they really, um, I wanted that hybrid kind of role to have both the technical side, but also the more business um, marketing um, aspect of, of the, of the data part. That's awesome. And something you said earlier is you were lucky that you were sort of a part of this big data boom. Mm -hmm. I fall into that sort of same class mm -hmm. because to me, we were really fortunate that there was enough data that it made the neural network architectures relevant again. So before they existed, I think as early as the 1960s almost mm -hmm. or early 70s, but there just wasn't enough data to make them as useful as they could be. And now we live in this world with massive compute. We live in this world with huge volumes of data and a technology and infrastructure that was built a long time ago now can shine. And it's really interesting, you know, what other innovations have been created that were essentially before their time are now relevant and useful because of essentially just technology evolution. Yep. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's such an exciting and, and fascinating overarching topic. I'm yeah. sure you deal with that in your everyday work and stuff too. Yeah, I could think, for example, automation and robotics, right? Automation is not a new concept, has been around for decades as well. Uh, but until we really uh, started having the technology and the data in place to build more advanced robotics using machine learning as well, uh, it wasn't really possible to do as much as we're doing today. Like yesterday, I saw this barista that it's a robot and makes cappuccinos, and it does a pretty fantastic job, uh, which, you know, it, cut, it, re it causes different reactions as every new technology. People love it, some people are like, this is so creepy. Um, but, but you're right. So sometimes you need the, the right conditions for something to really take off and, and happen. Um, and I can think of generative AI as the newest, you know, kind yeah. of well, technology. I'd love to dive into that in a second. Another example I just thought of is a lot of people don't know this. The first cars were planned to be electric cars. So Thomas Edison had a big portion or a big, I guess, leg in the auto market. Yeah. And it was Henry Ford that came in and said, I have this combustion engine and it's at the time significantly more sustainable, more <laughs> scalable than electric was. Now we fast forward to today where yeah. electric cars, the technology has caught up to the idea and it's become viable again. And to me, that's an, another just great that's example true. of like the technology, the ideas are there. Part of you know entrepreneurship, part of any of these of good business is figuring out when is the time to leverage them mm -hmm. rather than um, just trying to force something down the throat of society that might not be ready for it. I agree. That's a great point. So I'm interested in how do you go from your master's degree into the work you're doing now? How do you sort of blend the statistics and foundational technical knowledge with the business side of things? Um, so after my master's, I started to work as a data engineer. Um, I was working at actually my university in Rome, uh, that's where I studied. Um, and it was just a bunch of Excel spreadsheets to be quite frank. Um, and so it was really my first time uh, applying, you know, the data uh, preparation, data quality part. Um, and then I moved uh, into what my current company is that I've been working now for quite a few years, um, SaaS. And I started working for SaaS in Italy, and I started working as a data scientist. So I was completely just coding um, and working with customers to sort of identifying um, opportunities for them to apply analytics and artificial intelligence. And I think that was my first time when I really um, could see in practice how important it was to have that hybrid knowledge of both data and business. 
because I could find myself in a room talking with data scientists, right? And that was really easy for me. Just talk technical, show me the code, show me the approach, show me the architecture, what you're, you're, what you're thinking to build. But then when their boss came in the room, that was a whole different level of conversation. And so, and, and my, you know, my, the skills that I, try, that I started to build there was how to, how to translate that, the value that, you know, the, the power of data into value. And ultimately that value is business value, right? If you're working with organizations, they wanna know what's gonna be my return on this investment. Why should I even analyze my data? Why should I even do anything with my data? And so that is where I was applying. So I was passing, moving from doing something like coding to building an ROI calculator based on the KPIs that the customer or the organization was trying to achieve, like maximizing returns on something or minimizing waste on a, on a certain manufacturing process, right? And so um, that is where I was applying both, especially in the pre-sales, um, we call it pre-sales world, which means like essentially is the, the development of a business case with an organization before you actually go and implement a technology. Interesting. So you know, from my perspective, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, a lot of data scientists, a lot of technical people, at the end of the day, they're not signing the checkbook. They're not the ones who are signing off on projects. Yeah. And, you know, in some ways that's <clears throat> fundamentally a little bit flawed because you want the people that understand the systems to be the biggest proponents of them and actually having the decision-making power to do that. Absolutely. But in the biggest companies, especially if you're working in the Fortune 500, yeah. usually it's a business person uh, or a finance person that's making these decisions. And you know, if you want your work to have impact as an engineer or a technical person, for better or for worse, you have to have it. Uh, you know, someone who is non-technical understand the value of it, and that's such a exciting battle for some people, mm -hmm. and then also for a lot of like pure engineers, an unbelievably frustrating one. I absolutely agree with you. I can see that, and, and um, I can see that as well. So I always, you know, I like I like participating in mentorship initiatives. And the, my piece of advice to data scientists or people that are starting the career in data and tech is always to never stop learning that storytelling capability. Which I'll be honest with you, when someone told me that the first time, I'm like, come on, these are like, I don't need this. I need, you know, numbers are going to speak for me. Because when you come from technical, you always think that that's enough. Mm -hmm. And actually that's gonna be your differentiator, right? Like I'm able to code, I'm able to build the systems, like, and you're not. Yeah. So I'm better, like I can do this things so that you can't. But then at the end of the day, the, the goal is to convince someone that, that what we do as data scientists has potential and has value, and that it's our responsibility to do so. Um, so I always advise to do courses on storytelling or uh, communication or more simply public speaking, which might, which might sound odd, but that's true. Um, what I've seen in the past 10 years is since the first article came out, you know, data scientist is the sexiest job of the, of the last century. Um, I've seen an ev evolution in the, in the profile of data scientists or or data engineers or developers, obviously not for everyone, but a, a lot of a good amount of them have evolved into this from being um, seen as the I don't know if it's going to sound bad, but like the nerd in the company that just develops something and doesn't interact with the rest of the organization to really becoming influencers. So in my conversations with organizations, I find myself talking more and more every day with data scientists that have established a really close trusted relationship with the business and with the decision makers um, and so they become influencer influencers in influencing those decision makers to sign the check um, and i think that what allows us as data scientists to do that jump in building that trusted relationship is the ability to to have communication skills let's take a second to hear from one of our amazing sponsors that supports the show Ever wonder how to keep your AI models not just smart, but responsible and effective? That's why I've partnered with Aporia. Their AI performance platform offers full-scale observability and real-time AI guardrails. Trust me, if you're in the data science field, Aporia's got your back. Don't miss out. Check them out at aporia.com. This episode of Cat's Neighbors is brought to you by Ziba HP. 
HP's high compute, workstation grade, ladder products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. Yeah, and I think that for a lot of people, that's a bit of a harsh reality is that if you want to get ahead in your career, if you want to be able to make an impact or instigate real change within your organizations, yeah. you, you kind of have to pick that. up these skills. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can get it done with purely technical skills, right? Yeah. If you're a 10X engineer, which are unbelievably rare, we need you, those. you can be in a closet and, <laughs> oh, yeah. and code all you want. But a lot of the times, those people aren't in the data domain. They're more working on pure engineering tasks, Correct. Even, even data engineering or software engineering, ML engineering, yeah. things that have a lot more concrete outcomes. For better or for worse data science, it's very hard to evaluate before the fact, to say, hey, we have this project, explain to me the ROI on it when it's a predictive model or something <clears> along <throat> those lines. Yeah, It's virtually impossible, <laughs> and you kind of have to sell those things. They, you know, I'm sure we both believe they have value, yeah. but to put a dollar figure on value for a next quarterly budget is unbelievably I difficult know. to do. I mean, there is a whole department in, in business called value engineering, and they only do that. Like they take, their job is to really translate that number or whatever model you build or you know data case, and to translate that into into value. Like here's how much dollar you're going to save. Here's how much dollar you're going to make. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with you. And I mean, I also agree when you said you know not everybody has to to be a data storyteller or be that influencer or that data scientist or evolve in that direction in your career. I mean, my career took a completely different direction. I'm not a data scientist today. And so I think there's no right or wrong. I, I, I think it's perfectly fine. It's actually wonderful to be a, a really tech savvy um, software developer that just stays in the room and just love doing what they do. Um, but just be aware that there's always going to be someone that's gonna take your work and present it with a story to somebody else. So if you like being that person, then you want to develop those communication skills. If you don't like being that person, if you're fine with someone just taking your work and bringing it to the director and, and selling it to them, somebody else to do that, that's fine. Yeah, but there is also a downside of that. I, I've always felt that if I'm not presenting my own work, same. You know, someone else is probably going to take credit for yeah. it. Same. Or the which is generally I'm I'm fine with as long as it's helping to grow organization and. Absolutely. I know all the people I work with, if they're presenting my work, they give me credit and, and they're, you know, they're celebrating the other people that are working with. But if you're presenting your own work, you also can shape the story and, and you know all the nuances of that story. Right. And so I think you're, you're usually the best person to try to tell the story if you start to develop those skills. And I know that can be really intimidating. I, obviously, I'm not very intimidated by this based on the content right. and the work that, I, <laughs> that I'm in. But... I, I completely empathize with people that are a bit more apprehensive about being willing to share their work directly or create narratives around it. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested, you, you said you're from Italy, you went to school in Italy, you started working in Italy, now we're in North Carolina. <laughs> yes. How has that transition been for you? <laughs> um, so that transition happened in 2020 like right in the middle of time, COVID, yeah, yeah um, the pandemic. So I was working in Italy as a data scientist um, and especially for banking and insurance um, organizations, industries, <clears throat> and um, manufacturing too. That's a passion of mine as well. And so what um, I simply received a job offer to, like I had an opportunity to uh, transition internally uh, in my current company, it's as, um, within the product marketing strategy team. Um, and I, at the beginning, I was a little, you know, skeptical. I'm like, marketing? Like, the only word that resonated to me in that job title was marketing. And I'm like, I don't want to do social media. I don't want, like, that was the first thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was like, no, like, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. Um, but then, you know, I, 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 I try to give, I decided to give it a try, right? Always keeping in mind that curious mindset that I, that I have. I'm like, I'll, I'll give it a try. I'll see, you know, worst case, I'll tell, this is not for me. 
I'm out of it. And so what happened is that then I went into the interview process and actually found out that product marketing strategy is a whole different world. Like you don't, you, you, it's, it's so much more than what I thought. What I thought. Um, and I, I loved the, the job, the way it was described to me. I loved the potential of it. And so I decided to, to go for it. Um, and so there was a whole, you know, transition process. And then I moved here uh, in 2020. So I've been almost three years now. Um, it's been a process. Do you want to know how if I like it? <laughs> oh, I bet. Enjoy. I, I was in Italy for basically a month yeah. and a half this year, and it was culture shock for me. So I can't imagine what going oh, the man. other direction. Oh, yeah. man. The first thought I have, like, these people don't know how to drive. <laughs> I felt the same way in Italy. So it See? So it's great. like, yeah, yeah it's like ad adaptation. That's all it is about. So, uh, yeah, it's been great. I mean, it, it, obviously cultural shock, right? Like, for me, a big thing is food. As an Italian, it's we are all like everything is about food. Um, I moved here by myself too, so I left like all my family, my friends, and my colleagues, and like my entire life, and just took a plane and luggages and just moved here by myself. So that's that that was also that'll make it easier because I had to rebuild an entire network. Uh, but what I was driven from is really the passion that. So Italy, um, you know, the, the the work that I could do here in terms of AI and with data <laughs> in the U.S., like it or not, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, the U.S. is way more advanced right now. Like from from worldwide perspective, like if you think about it, U.S. is one of the top um, power when it comes to artificial intelligence as a country. Um, and so for me, it was really so exciting to, to, to have the opportunity to work on more advanced use cases, more advanced algorithms, more advanced techniques, and seeing also different markets and different business models. Um, and so I just decided to, to take the, the opportunity. Amazing. Can you tell me a little bit like, uh, about what it was like when you were like, in a new place sort of by yourself? I think a lot of people who listen, they're either going to a new school, they're starting a new job, maybe mm -hmm. far away. A lot of people are trying to get jobs in the U.S. and they come here and they're like, you know, this is so different from what I was doing. How do you adapt to that? How do you sort of make it your own in that sense? Hmm. Well, um, my experience, I wish there was a secret, like um, a secret recipe for this, but there isn't really. Um, I think, first of all, what I recommend is when you come to a new place, don't expect yourself to adapt immediately. Like it's gonna take time. If the first six months you regret the decision you made, don't go back. Don't give up yet, right? Like for the first three, four months for me was like, why did I do this? I miss Italy so much and I was crying. I mean, there were days that I was like, I don't want, like I used to go back from, from work at home and it was really hard being by myself. And at the beginning, you don't really have friends. Like you, you have colleagues, right? But you don't have friends that you call after work, like, hey, let's go get a drink or let's have like dinner. The time is helping you either with and, people at home. Oh man, I'm telling you, I used to get out of work here from like 5, 6 p.m. and everybody there was sleeping because like midnight. And so I didn't even have to call my family and call my friends and tell them about my day. Um, and so my piece of advice, my first piece of advice would be, it's normal that it sucks at first. Like if you think, but don't let that make you feel like you made the wrong choice um, because it's a process and it's not an easy process, but it's a very rewarding process. Like now after almost three years, I can tell that I made the best decision of my life to move here. I have built a network here. I have amazing friends here. Um, and I just bought my first home. Oh, congratulations. Yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Closing date yesterday. Um, and so here in North Carolina, believe it or not, the first time I came here, I still remember I called my mom and I'm like, mom, I just moved in a forest. Because yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so different. different. No right, so different from Rome. And, um, but now I just, you know, it's, as I said, it takes time. And my piece of advice for the people that have moved or they're about to move somewhere is just give yourself time. Give yourself time and go through those difficult moments, but don't let those difficult moments make you regret and, and go back to where you were or stop doing what you're trying to do because it's gonna be really, really rewarding. So maybe after those three months, six months, whatever it might be, was there something <laughs> or a moment where it just sort of clicked and you're like, oh, 
I like this, or I'm starting to like this, or was it just more of a slow, hey, this is uh, okay, a little bit more and more, I'm getting comfortable with it, I'm acclimating? Um, I think there was a moment actually, because I moved here and then I stayed here for like um, eight months, like seven months, and I didn't go back to Italy. So I was missing my, like my home and my family so much. And so I was really sad, right? And I was like, this is the worst choice. I don't like this. I can't wait to go back. And so I had booked um, time to go to Italy for that. It was summer. And so luckily, like you as well, right? We do, we can do remote working, right? So I'm like, you know what? I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go for just a week or two. I'm gonna go for two months. Like I wanna spend as much time as possible working from there because, you know, my company has an office in Rome, so I could have still gone there and see my old colleagues too, or work from home and still spend time with my family, get some vacation. So I'm like, I'm just gonna take two months and just enjoy it. I went back, obviously I was so happy. And uh, at first I'm like, oh, I wanna stay here forever. I don't wanna go back. But then after like a month and a half that I was there, I started missing what I had here. And I feel like that is the first moment when I was like, I realized that what I was doing with my life, it was the right thing for me. So the fact that what really helped me, I can say is the going back home. So doing what I was really missing and what I thought it would have make me happy forever, doing that and then realizing that, that made me realize that actually what I was building here, it was so worthy for me. Um, and so that's where I, slowly start saying, okay, Marnie, like you, is, this is not gonna be easy, right? Like you're gonna go back, you're gonna miss your family again, but now you have that awareness, you have built that awareness that this is the right choice for you. And so it, it, I started fighting with more pleasure. Like I was like, okay, now I, I, I want to commit to settle. And I thought that's where the, then the process started for me to be more, like having more acceptance uh, about this place and really starting to embracing it. I like that. It seems like sometimes you just need a, a reminder of why you did it. And then you're like, you know what? This yeah. is all aligned with the stuff that I want. And I, there's just, it all sort of starts falling into place, you know, like yeah. it's all stacked up and then it slowly sort of merges into a, a cohesive image. I think, it, at least for me, some of the best personal changes and improvements I've made in my life have come from geographical change. You know, whether it was leaving school, whether it was doing any of these things, every new place that I went, I felt like I could completely reinvent myself and choose who I was in that scenario and build whatever part of my life I wanted to in that scenario. And That's it's nice really cool. to be able to like visit places that I was before and see the different chapters of my life. And I, I've always really relished that is that, okay, like I have a clean slate. I could be whoever I want. I could focus on whatever I want. I can leave the things that I didn't like about myself Fair. or the, or the, did, or the, the like people that I didn't necessarily resonate as much with in those right. places. It's not like they're going away. I can still go visit, but I've sort of created this own path and direction. Um, I love that. Especially with your career. It's like, wow, I'm here to, to you know, <clears throat> work in AI. I'm here yeah. to, to develop this. And the other stuff is great. I can always have it still. That's true, yeah. But, you know, I get the benefit of being able to really focus on this with, you know, you definitely have less friends, definitely have those things, but that means there's also sort of less distractions at the same time. Honestly, yes, that's a great way to put it. Like I can focus, like I can focus more on, on things that like, what's my passion here? Like, so yeah. Amazing, well, I'm interested in two things. So okay. I wanna learn more about your passion, but I also okay. wanna learn exactly what uh, product marketing strategy for <laughs> I think we mentioned it before. We should probably like set a firm definition. Let's do of what it. That means. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, product marketing strategy, as as the word itself, you know, um, says, is product. There is marketing. There is strategy. Um, every company has what it's known as product management or product strategy organization, right? <clears throat> Which is an organization that basically defines based on market research, based on uh, consumers' desires, whether they are anticipated or clear, manifested, right? Manifested um, based on total address, like market research data, competitive data, uh, business needs, budget, based on a lot of factors, you decide 
what are you going to sell? What are you going to build? Right? So in the software company, which is where I work for a soft AI software company, <clears throat> the product management, product strategy organization decides what kind of software are we going to build? Like, what are we going to, what are we going to sell? Right? Like, uh, and that's the product. So that's the product, right? Um, now, in the product, you have the product management. So it's the actual, okay, we're going to build, we decided that we're going to build glasses, okay? We're going to build glasses. That's what we decide. So like, let's go build it. So that's product management, right? Product management defines what it's known as product roadmap. So it's like, we're going to start with this kind of glasses. Then in six months, we're going to evolve into this other kind of glasses. Then we're going to put something accessorized on top of it and like other functionalities and other capabilities. And so they work with the research and development organization to build the glasses, right? Now, when the glasses are built, what happens is that the other piece of the product strategy comes in, which is a product marketing. Okay, so like, okay, now we build these glasses. How are we going to sell these? It's meaning, how are we going to convince people that this is worth it? How are we going to define the value? Why would people buy glasses? Why would people want to buy these specific glasses with these specific capabilities, right? So translating into AI software um, terminology, it means understanding how, what kind of, what my, my job is basically doing market research, studying our competition, uh, speaking with our customers, speaking with organizations like around the world, going at advance. So really being in that um, sponge mode in what's going on in the AI world and then understand, okay, how can, what should we build to offer to our customers and to the world as SaaS, like, right, as a software company? And then how do we market that? Like, for example, I am product marketing strategy lead for AI solutions, right? How are we positioning our AI solutions? So I do things like messaging. I do things like uh, positioning. I do things like competitive uh, enablement. Um, I speak with our customers. I present at advance. That's a big part of my job. I uh, build use cases, right? Like say, oh, here are the use cases that we are going to promote and we're going to push in the market and let's go. And here's the plan to go and execute that promotion. And go. So we are going to, for example, uh, go to this event because this event, it's, it's, it's cool. We're going to participate. We're going to do a podcast. We should do a podcast. So let's do a podcast, right? So identifying all those market opportunities on how to build awareness, reputation, engagement and create ultimately demand business money very cool so it seems like a lot of those things are related and they sort of have to connect mm -hmm. so the product um r d and those types of things yep. it also relies a little bit on what the market is doing and what people are interested Absolutely. in and that also flows into what you're doing and kind of trying to create a loop of we're building things people want we have to tell people why it's so valuable because we already know they want it and, and keep that circle going. Something I've become really interested in more recently is, uh, I love Steve Jobs and his story. I love him too. So he built a product that people didn't know they wanted. Yep. So how do you anticipate demand? How do you uh, focus on building also products that people didn't even know they needed? Mm -hmm. It's not easy. <laughs> Let's start with that. He spent a lot of time. Most I mean, of his Steve Jobs is Steve that, Jobs so. an outlier. He's a genius, so it's not like everybody wakes up in the morning and oh, I've anticipated needs. I wish it was that easy, but um, I think that uh, there, are, I, I, you know, I would say that it, it's all about like I know it's going to sound probably um, I don't know if this is what you're expecting, but soft skills i think are really important like being really curious like i think curiosity is a really really big skills for for people especially that work in data and in technology like always having that open mind in saying what can i learn next what is happening like every morning i read the news every morning i read like i listen podcasts every every day i i try to learn as much as possible instead of just focusing on like okay my day is going to be opening my laptop doing what I'm doing and then closing it when it's 5 p.m. and then go do other things, right? Like having that open mind and speaking with friends and speaking with colleagues and speaking with like, always having that interaction active. I think that really helps in, in being, in putting yourself in a position where you're wondering, okay, what's gonna happen next? How's the future gonna look like? 
Um, so anticipating market needs or customer needs or consumer needs, um, I think it's all about always being aware of what customers are going and where they started from. Uh, so for me, for example, with the, now with the wave of generative AI, you know, I like to think, how is this technology going to impact the future, right? How is this, what new business models is this technology going to bring? How, what is this going to mean for my job? What is this going to mean for my customers? What is this going to mean for my daily life? Um, and so keeping these questions active, I think it's, it's, it's what really helps in, in, you know, trying to anticipate market needs. Then, of course, you can never um, really know until you try it. Steve Jobs said it too, right? Like you have to move forward to be able to tell that you were right what, what you did back. So then you try it and then you, you evaluate and then you see how, how you go. Um, I think the past teaches us a lot, teaches us a lot. When I go and I talk to people about generative AI and I ask about, okay, show me how many of you think this is valuable, show me how many of you are skeptical, and I have a lot of people that have different reactions, and that's fine, right? Like I expect people to have, every new technology creates different reactions. I still remember when the first smartphone was launched in 2007, I remember some people were saying, who in the yeah, world? This is stupid, it doesn't have a keyboard. Yeah, and they were like, why in the world would you wanna keep your photos in here? in this thing, right? I, I remember that. And, and, and if, you, if we think back about it now, it's like, that was an anti not anti like that was a need and like only Steve Jobs anticipated, right? Like nobody saw it, but they, now we need to be able to look back. Well, so actually Steve Jobs didn't even anticipate that. So okay. the, the person who invented Polaroid, who is someone who Steve Jobs idolized, I forget the guy's name, his vision of I don't remember his name either now was to basically like point and click and make it so simple, okay. um, and essentially the idea of what a modern smartphone camera is. Yeah, and I, I don't know if Steve Jobs directly Jobs directly like took influence from that or whatever okay. it might be, but that's essentially exactly what he built into the iPhone. Is you open right. it, you point and click, and you shoot. You don't have to do any processing, do any of that type of yeah. stuff. Yeah. So I, I think it's like really cool to see what you're saying, like history, it's sort of what we were talking about earlier, but like history wasn't ready or technology wasn't ready for the camera that Polaroid was, that, that uh, the founder of Polaroid was envisioning. But now it's enabled uh, far enough for, for Steve Jobs to capitalize on that. And he was conscious enough of the opportunity for that in the market and the history around it yeah. to bring it into fruition. It, it also seems like what you were saying, if I, if I rephrase you a little bit, is sure. just, you know, listening and asking questions and understanding a market gives you enough context around them to start reading in between the lines. Absolutely. And when you read in between the lines, you can start saying, hey, this is a problem that these people have, and maybe we can create a solution to fix it. I think that yes. that's kind of what you were getting at, where it's like, hey, this is how, it, to get to unarticulated needs, you really have to study these people. Yeah. Some of it can be data-driven, some of it probably has to be qualitative and, and really digging down and looking into understanding what who they are and what they do. Yeah, you phrased it in much better English than mine. <laughs> I, got it. I was Perfect. just rephrasing what you were saying. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so you mentioned generative AI. I yep. know that's something that you're immensely passionate about. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about that and your involvement yeah. with it? Sure. So currently, you know, my involvement with it, it's really about, you know, with the with the <clears throat> explosion of this technology that it's going to shape our future in unimaginable ways, right? Um, my my job kind of evolved as well. So as I was before ChatGPT came, you know, was launched to the general availability, uh, my focus was only purely AI, right? And like, I don't want to use the word traditional AI because it makes it look old, which is not old, but like the AI before generative AI, that was my focus. With generative AI, now my focus at work has, act has expanded around, okay, what, what we were saying before, like, what are we gonna build around generative AI? What are, what are, what are customer want, right? Like, what are the market needs? What, how should SaaS position itself in this, in this new wave, right? As a software company that has been around for 40 years and has this huge experiences in AI and analytics and industries already, how do we, how are we gonna leverage and enter this market? Um, so that's my focus on it right now from, from a job professional like standpoint. 
I really, I'm really passionate about this technology because um, I think that the evolutionary aspect of it is that for the first time, technology is going to become a collaborative partner that contributes to ideas and content. So I think that technology is not going to be just a tool anymore, it's going to be like a team member, like one that never gets tired, never sleeps, is just brimming with information. And so I think that with generative AI, we are kind of witnessing a, a, a complete uh, evolution of the interaction between human intelligence and artificial intelligence for the first time. Like the way I see it is that generative AI is gonna make AI easy for everyone to use. Not just for tech savvy people, like now everyone is gonna be able to use it. Um, I can think of my mom, right? Like she's trying to decorate my home by uploading pictures of my living room it, to, to a free application that does internal interior design. That was something that was unimaginable two years ago, unless you were like a professional interior designer and you had like some paid application that your company had purchased to do that, but because that was your business. Like now my mom can do it and my mom still has no clue what AI is. But she knows that she takes a picture, uploads it, picks a style, modern, classic, living room, or, and she has it. So, but she has no clue about what generative AI is, what AI is. So I think to me, that's the fascinating aspect of it, that it's gonna enter our lives no matter what we think about this technology. Like, this is what I say to people, like it doesn't really matter what we think. So instead of trying to, because it's here to stay, so instead of trying to judge it or, or, or avoid it or try to control it, I'm seeing some people doing that as well, we should be wondering, like the question is not, is ChatGPT gonna take over my job? The question should be, how can I use ChatGPT to become more productive in my work? How can I use it to be better at my work, right? Because researchers are already pr pr showing that workers have increased productivity when they execute certain tasks uh, using generative AI versus when they're not using yeah. it. I think there was that study you, you'd mentioned it MIT. before MIT with yeah. some of the consulting firms. They yeah, they CG, they 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 did a they they studied like almost a thousand consultants. Now obviously they study only consultants, right? So statistically it's it's a very limited um, it's it's a it's a unique kind of a select profession, yeah. right? Like I'm interested to see if we say doctors or we see like other professions, how that changed. Uh, but for that specific case, that's what the research shows. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you 100%. I think one of the challenges that I see and what I recommend for everyone is to learn how to use these tools to the best of your ability. Like it should be, and it, it, it is sort of a conflicting thing for me. So I think overarchingly, each individual person, it is in their best interest to learn these skills. Yeah. And, and to adopt the technology and use it because that is what helps you the most in your career. Yeah. Overarchingly, I see it kind of the opposite direction where if everyone is using these tools, you know, if one, it, one person at a company is doing the work of three people, that means the company is naturally going to have mm -hmm. um, the need for, you know, two people to do six people's worth of work rather than having three people to begin with. So you sort of get this pairing off. But I don't think that those types of things are mutable. There isn't anything that we can do to necessarily slow that change. So it becomes a greedy optimization al uh, algorithm for everyone to really pursue learning these technologies, to figure out how to integrate with them yeah. rather than to avoid them or do anything altogether. I mean, maybe you could go like go into a trade skill where they would not be as relevant and that would be a, a, like a different type huh? of hedge. But, but to me, the best option for <laughs> almost everyone is to pursue learning these and understand how they work and just realize that's gonna be an inevitability in most yeah. skill professions going forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I agree with you. I mean, you mentioned Ford before, right? Ford. Mm -hmm. If you think of that, if you look at how Ford was building cars, there were a hundred people to build one car. Yeah. Like today you need two. Yeah. At the best. And a lot of robot arms. Right. And you need like probably two engineers that like supervise or do like strategy around it or, you know, designing or I mean, I'm saying two, I'm sure there are more than two. But the point is that you don't need as many people as before. And 
is this going to happen with generative AI? I mean, there, I, I, of course, there is going to be mutation in 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 the job uh, system for sure. But I I really recommend people to have data literacy course. Like, if you haven't taken a data literacy course, go take it right now. Like, it's, yeah. cause the, this could become the next division between people who have access to certain possibilities and people who don't. Yeah. Well, I think to that point, something that separates people or will separate people in the next couple of years is, yes, I'm using these models, Yeah. but what are the limitations? Mm. When should I be looking to see if this is accurate or not? Yeah. And that skill set, that kind of branch of data literacy is going to be what separates people who are top performers from people who are just leveraging these things to get stuff done. So like, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Amazing. So you'd also mentioned you have offline that you have some passion projects you're working on because yeah. you're doing less coding now uh -huh. uh, in your normal work. You're working on some other stuff on the side. I'd love to hear more about those. Yeah. So um, weirdly, I don't know uh, how many people are going to agree with me, but I love I'm very fascinated by the data preparation aspect. So I love the modeling part. Don't get me wrong. Like, but I feel like with all these libraries that we have out there, it's pretty commoditized today. Um, so yeah, you want to do a logistic regression, you select the library, it's going to generate the code for you, and you just change the parameters. Or and then, to me, what it's really interesting as as a, in the coding and in the AI world is more the data preparation side. I know that some people are like, I hate it, right? Like I wish I could spend all my day just building and fine tuning models. I actually love it. <laughs> And I love that, and then I love the after. Like once I run the algorithm and I've built it, like okay, how do I interpret the result? What is it telling me? So what I'm working on right now is something around the data preparation side. I am very passionate about forecasting, and specifically time series forecasting. So everything that it's a sequence of dates and numbers, whether that could be demand, product sales, product, you know. Uh, stock prices or everything that has a series in time uh, kind of manifestation. Um, it could be second series or minute or days or you know whatever the timestamp is. So what I'm working right now is how do in in I think what's fascinating in time series is that they tell a story. Every time you plot it, you have a story right along over a time. And that story, it's different. There are many different kinds of time series. For the more passionate and about forecasting, you have seasonal time series, you have short time series, you have longer time series, uh, you know? And so what I'm doing right now, it's building sort of an automatic system that clusters the time series for me into certain categories and automatically generates for me and groups for me those time series uh, based on the cluster and the category that they um, that they fit into, so then they c I can go and I can apply different kind of techniques uh, to each time series type to increase the accuracy. Interesting. So an example of that would be like I have this these three years of data. It yeah. w it could um, translate everything into like day of the week. It could translate everything to monthly trends. It could translate everything yeah. to um, like some seasonal trend, like for um, shopping or something along those lines. For, for example, I can, I can give you like a very practical example, right? Like a bank. Okay, um, think about ATMs. Uh, it, banks have ATMs in like different kinds of the city, in different kinds of uh, different places around the same city, on a country level, on continent levels. Banks receive time series of withdrawals of money from people every day, okay? Now, you can use AI or you can use analytics or forecasting to predict the amount of withdrawals that people are gonna make, either on each ITM level or at a city level or a branch level or at a, at a region level or at a country level, right? And the reason why a bank want, wants to do that is because they pay somebody else to go and refill each of those ATMs. And there is like a huge, a big refilling fee. Um, and so time series for each ATMs are different. You can have ATMs that literally have people that go like once a day 
and that's it, or like 10 people in a day. So you have very short series. Or you have longer series, like you said, three years of analysis. Now, when you receive the data, the Excel spreadsheet, you have no idea. Unless you go and you plot each series one by one and you see, oh, for this I have a lot of data. I can do a very accurate prediction here. For this, oh, I have like 10 days. Like, I, I can at best do a, an average and have that be the, the, predict, the prediction for the next withdrawal amount, right? Or this one, or this one is really seasonal. So this is like a type of like RMO or like t seasonal algorithm, right? A type of forecasting algorithm. And so, but instead of doing that manually or like just giving it to a software, all the time series together, you could group them and have divided the seasonal ones just being in one file for you. And that file also automatically applies certain algorithms to you. Very cool. And then the short series are already like categorized. And to those, you already apply the average because you know. Or there are some series that are like sometimes they are outliers. Like there are some series that you have at one point. You can't do nothing about it. You just need to delete it, right? And take it out of the analysis. And so, and for the longer series, there, for the ones that you have three years of data, which is like a dream for, for a forecaster. Then there you can say, okay, take these, the ones that you have categorized as long, do not just ARIMA, not just exponential smoothing, do also machine learning. Try all these different techniques and tell me the best model for each of these. And so it's like a, it's like a, a way of d making the data ready that they are ready for different types of analysis automatically. Very cool. So it seems like sort of auto ML prep for time series in some it's sense. Yeah, applying clustering good. algorithms in the data prep process. That's really cool. It's sort of like a meta meta algorithm. Kind of. kind of. Right? You just branded it. Yeah, there you go. You should Perfect. work in product marketing yeah, strategy. Really <laughs> uh, amazing. Honestly, those are all the questions I had. Uh, super interesting story. I love what you're doing uh, with generative AI. Love what you're doing with uh, your personal projects on the, oh my, I forgot what we just called it, the uh, meta, meta, meta algorithm uh, for meta forecasting, project. I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, any, any final thoughts, any words <laughs> of wisdom for people listening at home? Uh, well, going back to generative AI, I, you know, I encourage people to learn about it. I encourage people to learn not just chat GPT, something that I really always uh, care about mentioning is that generative AI is much more than chat GPT. Uh, inform yourself on things like synthetic data generation. What is it? How can I apply it? What does it mean? Or digital twins. That's another topic that I'm, you know, here at my, you know, at SAS, we are currently investigating and, and we have great results on like dig generating digital twins. That's a, that's not a chat GPT. That's, that's a, but that's a generative AI technology that is going to revolutionize the industry. Um, and another piece of advice that I, as a woman in tech, I'm going to speak right now as a, as a woman in tech to all the women and the girls that are, that are looking at your podcast, we need to stay involved. Um, I don't think I'm saying a surprise if I say that this is a male dominant field. There are researches that show that researchers fail in collecting data on women when building algorithms. The majority of the algorithms out there, they're biased towards man, and that reflects us and impacts our life as women from the, you know, at home to daily work environment, everything in between. We have vehicle safety systems, urban design system. They are built and tested toward, biased towards man. Vehicle car systems, safety systems, are tested and built on the standard male body. A woman is 47%, has 47% more chances to die than a man in a car crash. And 17% and 47% more chances to get seriously injured in a car crash than a man. Invisible Women is a book by a journalist. Um, if you wanna know all about it, and there are research that show how researchers fail in collecting data on women. And so I invite all the women to stay involved in this. We have an opportunity with this generative AI wave to change this. So we need to be involved as women, asking questions, being active, educating ourselves, being part of those opportunities of mentorship and opportunities to learn. Um, 
and help that fill that, you know, reach that gender equality. We failed with AI. We can't fail with generative AI. So that's the message that I want to close this with. Amazing. Well, I will also link uh, the Invisible Women book in the description of this podcast so everyone can read up on that. It's actually sitting on my nightstand, so it's to be read. Uh, maybe I'll read that when I go home. But thank you so much for your time. Thank I you. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thank I can't you. wait till we have another one. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks, everyone.